Hey Watchers, I'm Ian Dodgen, Director of Oka. Something to fire the imagination while we're all staying home. We're talking world building and the appliance of new technologies in storytelling and research. In conversation, our Minori Ravindran, international editor at Variety, who's hosting, Hazraf Haz Dalal, producer director at Haz Films, Dr. Becca Wilson, MRC Innovation Fellow at the University of Newcastle, Alex Stoltz, founder and creative director at Future of Film, and Medja Bean Patrick, Chief Financial Officer at Creative England. And now, here's Manori. Hi, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us uh, for the inaugural Ochre Salon. So has your filmmaker with world building technologies at the heart of what you create, um, and you also teach about world buildings. Um, your projects, I mean, they seem incredible, and I'm excited to hear about them. Um, when we talk about world building, what exactly does that mean? Is it the creation of any world? Can you, can you explain? Sure. Like in the most simple, concise way, I would describe world building is essentially the process of creating a universe for which the story takes place in. And that would essentially define the time the story is set in. It connects the audience visually and emotionally, sets rules for the world so that the characters and our audience knows what takes place. And let's just make it clear that world building isn't just for science fiction. You know, world building is, could be rom-coms, it could be period drama, like I've mentioned, it could be a sports drama. We've seen such a big, massive explosion of world building. There's a really exciting tool to take creativity to a, to a very different level and actually um, sort of, you know, uh, take the boundaries away and, and, and anything is possible. When you are building a world, literally anything is possible. And it, it, is, the, it is height of creativity in my, sense, in, in my eyes. You know, what's different about some of the technologies as well? And what have they, what have they enabled you to do as a, as a filmmaker? You know, the interesting about technology, especially when you're talking with technology that involves visual effects, computer graphics, CGI, um, it allows me to, as a filmmaker and also other filmmakers to really explore our imaginations. Like every filmmaker has a set idea in their head of what that world's going to be like. But until you go into that world building process where you're playing with the ideas, you're molding things, you're kit bashing you know, inspiration together to create that world. That is where technology comes in. We have such amazing visual technology that is on the bar of photorealism that really allows us as filmmakers to really explore ideas, but also kind of deliver the vision in a much more um, relatable way. This is all technology that's doing one thing only. It's empowering the filmmakers to tell their stories and find new ways of communicating their stories and their characters to the audience. I'm wondering if you can maybe show your show reel at this point, and perhaps that will help to sort of um, illuminate some of the things that you're, that you're going to talk about too. Sure. I said stay live. This, this is, is life. And this unprecedented mix of human consciousness and technology. I would suggest that this is the beginning of the future of astronauts to come. I see it! Excuse me, truck! Over there! Go! Coming through! On your left! Now on your right! The new fuck off! Cool. There you go. Yeah, it's a little snippet of the world building. As you can see, there's a combination of science fiction worlds. There's also kids television with Disney. And there's a lot of world building in that. Um, so yeah, you know, that 45 second clip should give you an insight of the various world building that I've been involved in. And we will come back and we will um, have plenty more questions um, afterwards as well. But I think it'd be good at this point, probably to um, to chat a bit with with Alex, um, who heads up Future of Film. Yeah, hi, hi, Minori. Um, film has been historically pretty kind of isolated um, and um, I wouldn't say aloof, but maybe uh, you, 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 could, you could suggest that it, you know, it, it didn't really want to learn, take a lot from other, um, you know, platforms and mediums. And in this age when there are now so many different forms of storytelling from VR to, to games to short form, um, we believe it's really important 
that film is much more inclusive and expansive in terms of uh, in terms of how it takes ideas in terms of how we even define film what is a film it's a story it's a visual screen screen based story i think that's how we uh we see it and in this age where you can tell stories across all of these different platforms and there's so many different opportunities that's where we think world building can play a really exciting part because as a creative process it's not tied to any particular format and, and how would you say the new generation of, of filmmakers is is benefiting as well yeah well i think the 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 two the two kind of key like axis of what we talk about in the future of film report which brings together a lot of these ideas is is one is world building and then the other is uh real-time game engine tools um which, which which is also known as virtual production what's what really exciting about these tools is that they're really accessible um there's not uh you know they are available for free if you're uh, if, if you're not doing it for commercial purposes and if you are there's you know very you know reasonable licenses for, for tools like unreal engine or unity and that's where we see there's a huge opportunity and what's <laughs> what's really exciting about these tools as well is they come from the games industry the you know the industry where film was always you know rather kind of sniffy about and now uh, all of the, you know, all of these tools are coming across to, to film. Um, has your sort of, I sort of saw you nodding your head when we were talking <laughs> about, uh, about games and the crossover. Do you want to, do you want to elaborate on that a little yeah, bit? Yeah, def definitely. Yeah, thanks, Nori. Um, I was actually smirking about it because I started my career in the video games industry. So back in 97, 98, I was working on like PlayStation 1. It kind of shows my age here, but PlayStation 1, Dreamcast games. And, you know, I did, I went into the games industry because I couldn't find a route getting into filmmaking because back then, you know, visual effects training was a niche, right? There wasn't many visual effects training. But what's, what's really funny is I remember trying to get work in the film industry. And the minute you say you work in games, there's this level of snobbery because, oh, it's games, you know, it's not film. You know, film is this and games is like this playing field. Whereas now, if you look at today, you'll find that there's this like, the, the lines are blurred so massively, there's like this cross-pollination now. Whether you're a crew member or whether you are a filmmaker or a producer, you're able to jump between those industries because technology allows you to do that today. And that, that's why I was smiling a lot. <laughs> no, totally. And I, I think it's quite interesting from a content perspective too. I mean, if you look at something like, I mean, just in terms of ideas and the crossover, if you look at The Witcher on Netflix, which is their biggest show, like, you know, well, yeah. so they say, but we you know one of their <laughs> biggest shows. And that's a, that's a game, you know, that is a, that is a game. That's obviously you know, the concept is so, um, so punchy that it's, it's made that transition like seamlessly and look and how well it's doing. I was just wondering if you can kind of, you know, as, as a filmmaker, if you can kind of take us through some examples of the new world building technologies and how sort of some of the scale can be achieved. Um, can you, do you, do you have some examples that you can provide? Sure. Here's one I prepared earlier. The obvious one to show is previs. So previs is basically the process in where you visualize your world from script to storyboard to a moving version of that of that storyboard without you know without having to go and shoot stuff. So I've used previs pretty much on all of my projects, um, and I'm going to show you an example here. So here's an example of previs where you know th this is movie origin unknown. You know the budget was just under a million, so it wasn't very big for what we were doing. Um, so in the script, it actually says she wakes up and you know, we establish the location she's, she's in, which is going towards the building. So this is all shot in a studio. So we use something called Maya, which is the 3D software, to actually block that out. And using that and now enables me as a filmmaker to come out with, to try as many ideas as possible and fail at those ideas at that stage, rather than failing on the day on the set, I just go and execute and focus on performances of the actors. Um, another example of previs was when we were trying to build the set, we had limited money to build the set. And I really, w and there wasn't anything that existed um, with the world that we live in today for the 
for the set that I wanted to build. So up here, you can see this is the previous that I worked very closely and collaborated closely with the production designer, John Bunker, and our cinematographer, um, Adam Skullsort, who at an early stage, which is not necessarily you bring in a cinematographer at this stage, usually they come in later on, but we kind of are convincing producers to put some funds aside to bring the production and I bring myself and bring our first AD as well as the cinematographer to sit around the table and while we just move around this virtual set here, you know, we really went very accurate. Like what we built was pretty much, I would say 98% what we planned in previs. So from a technology point of view, it saved us thousands and th maybe hundreds of thousands it saved us because we planned all of that. Um, the other thing I wanted to also show is um, virtual production because that's something we're doing today and that's a big part of how I'm able to make my films. So like if I was to make Origin Unknown, which was made two years ago, if I was to make that today, I would probably take an approach like this. So here, instead of sitting on a computer screen, moving my mouse around, I've connected um, my iPad with the Unreal Engine, which is a real-time game engine, right? What I was able to do was I was able to really be virtually on set and see what it would be like using real weight cameras, real weight lenses to see what that would be like way in advance. And that's the point of virtual production is you're playing. And this is at a stage where we don't have any production funding. This is all at a development funding. But now development finance is now not just being used to create a lovely script and some pictures. We're able to create a 15 minute version of a scene used in virtual production and use that to raise finance, use that to get actors interested in the project. But more importantly, kind of like confirm to myself as a filmmaker that this idea is going to work as opposed to fixing it in the edit. I mean, just the economics of it are, are you know, in terms of, in terms of cost, and I don't think people quite realize the extent to which, you know, you can actually, the, the cost savings of pre, you know, previs and yeah, so, Absolutely. Um, I mean, at this point, I think it would be, it's a great intersection to talk a little bit about the, um, the science of all of this. Um, and Becca, I'm just wondering if actually you can talk a little bit about some of the uh, world building technologies that you've applied to your specific health uh, research as well. The main focus of my research at the moment is around uh, investigating, uh, I suppose, why uh, and how uh, people can interpret visual information in these sorts of immersive environments. In particular, I'm looking in, um, in VR environments and also looking at how people interact with their environment as well. Uh, in my case, uh, my environment is the visualisation of data, but then I suppose we are at a time now where that kind of research can actually feed into, for example, world building in um, other VR um, environments like for games or for films as well. And so I think it's it's a really important point that was made earlier where we're, we're living in a time now where, um, you know, this uh, the technology in terms of the building these worlds and the visualisation of them, like CGI and things like that, is so realistic, um, can, which can really... Uh, you know, as I said, it looks so close to real world. And if you're doing research into these interactions of people in these environments, you can make those interactions and their experience seem more real as well. And then um, we're combining that with these new immersive technologies to, again, add this extra layer of um, sort of, uh, I guess, presence within these sorts of environments. And, uh, and I think that's really exciting. I guess from a, a health research perspective, you know, we can use these environments to apply research that we already have been have been doing. For example, in terms of building these worlds and building these environments, we can actually use our current research to inform the building of those. Um, and then from the other side of things, we can actually use these environments and these worlds to conduct our research in. And so I guess as a scientist, as a researcher, I can benefit um, two ways from um, this uh, convergence of technology basically. In my research space it's more um, the immersive technology so virtual reality um, and I know um, you know augmented reality as well. I guess uh, broadly in the in the health research domain virtual reality is used for a number of uh, can be used in a number of ways um, so as I mentioned earlier that you know our research can inform world building or the application of something within virtual reality um, but also we're using uh, 
the technology or the environment to simulate real world events and real world situations, for example, for training purposes or for um, understanding particularly human behavior around a particular subject. Um, so, uh, but also they can be used for this sort of environment, these technologies can be used also for rehabilitative purposes. Mm -hmm. So for example, um, I know of projects that are using sort of almost like uh, virtual reality games to enhance the memory in people that have specific health conditions where uh, their memory is uh, perhaps um, not at full capacity. Um, or even also spatial awareness as well to develop those spatial or enhance spatial awareness in people that perhaps have conditions where they're losing um, that ability as well. Can you talk about some specific projects or? Uh, from my own or just generally? Uh, from your own. From my own. So, um, so basically my main, uh, I guess, interest is to exploit this immersive environment, these immersive environments in order to convey information from data in a better way. What I've been doing recently is running experiments uh, on uh, some members of the public or um, some participants that have volunteered to take part in the study to look at, I guess, uh, a couple of things such as um, the level of immersion that they have whilst they're in virtual reality. And I guess looking at um, some of the reasons and mechanisms as to, mechanisms as to why uh, certain people feel more immersed in these environments than others. So a typical day would be to uh, have a participant come in and to uh, basically explore a data visualization um, and you can see the, the visualization is just in the background there. Um, and I thought what, what was really interesting about this picture was that it really captures the fact that some people explore I guess these environments almost at a distance this is what I'm noticing. Whereas others, like this particular participant, has, um, you know, they, they felt so immersed that they're actually on the floor looking upwards at this bit or through this visualization from the floor. There's a big difference in uh, how people interact with an, in an environment, particularly if they're unfamiliar with that technology. And so in this example, I've got my boss here who's uh, trialing the actual experiment that I was going to run. There's me in the background and I look like I'm either pulling out my hair or laughing, um, crying maybe, because uh, all of the other testers that I'd had prior to my boss, uh, they were all sort of like, you know, uh, under 40 maybe, whereas uh, my boss is of the baby boomer generation. And so he found it incredibly difficult um, to I guess, ground himself in this virtual environment. And so it, it brought up a really important point where um, it's something that, for example, researchers like myself need to consider when we're running these sorts of experiments in terms of, you know, potentially biasing our understanding of how people interact in these worlds. So which is a question also maybe to uh, you guys is like, how can you make your, uh, when, you're, when you're creating this sort of interactive style content, how can you as creators make it easier for a much wider group of people to actually engage with them? Is that perhaps a challenge which is specific to VR or those kind of immersive technologies, would you, would you say, Becca? No, I think it is something that's unique to VR in particular, because I think with AR, um, because that's essentially overlaying the real world you still have that real world there in front of you to ground you I suppose um, whereas it, I think it's uh, we have to be much more careful in a, a virt fully virtual environment. And how would you say you sort of work collaboratively across the sectors as well? Outside of academia I've been uh, you know I, I have worked with um, games developers in order to understand you know basically to explore these environments in order to understand what is the most appropriate envir environment for myself to work in, in order to do this type of research. And, and so I have collaborated with a number of games uh, developers on these sorts of projects. Um, one, one particular project was funded by the Wellcome Trust. And uh, in that project, I worked with uh, a games company called Masters of Pi, who are based in London. And uh, basically, we actually, instead of having that usual researcher uh, collaboration 
where we're just providing expertise for something that a creative um, industry is doing, uh, for example, like building a film or something. Um, this was actually a much more robust collaboration where both from the research side and the games developer side, we were co-designing visualization methods in virtual reality. And so, you know, this dynamic between research and um, sort of uh, games industry for me particularly has changed now. And so it's a slightly different dynamic. I mean, I just want to follow on what Becca is saying. Like, like I really wish I had access to someone like Becca when I was making my first film because it was heavily reliant on research. In fact, what I'm going to do, I'm going to quickly share my screen. So I want to show you something that taps into this whole um, inspiration and um, research. So my first film, The Beyond, now I'm not a writer. I'm not saying I'm a writer. I'm a director that writes out of necessity, okay? Because I know screenwriting is an art form that is just, you know, you just need a lot of experience in. But, you know, as a first filmmaker, you've got to write your first script. And I remember writing, it was very technically driven. And, you know, it's really about space exploration. Now, I'm sure, Becca, if you read the first draft, you'll be like, there's no way any of this exists. But here's the thing. So I collaborate with someone called Keith Batchelor, who's a friend of a friend of a friend, who's got a PhD in, um, in physics and who just knows this stuff. And I really wanted someone I could bounce stuff to rather than just being in my own little bubble. And one of the things we did was he then got back and said comments like, you know, one general comment is quite hard to write convincing sounding scientists. They're usually quite particular on how they talk about things. Right, Becca? So, um, so... I had to adjust my dialogue and work with the actors and give the actors YouTube clips of existing scientists that are talking so they can mimic that. And then, yeah, his notes were just, I mean, you can see this is tons and tons and tons of notes. But then stuff like ultrasonic waves, you don't, there's, you don't get that in space. It refers to sound above the frequency that a human can hear, all of that stuff. And yeah, it just went on and on, recon probe and it's tons. So it got to the point where I'm like, so my entire script is not filmable it's gonna be a load of bs so what i did was i kind of flipped it around i'm like okay i'm gonna take all of the things that this talented knowledgeable researcher has given me i'm gonna use that as dialogue so now when you watch the film there's loads of bits where the scientists will be saying stuff like it's impossible for a human being to travel through a wormhole it will spaghettify them that's insane whoever says they can do that is you know it's off their rockers and i use that critique in the script as dialogue for the actors. So now my actors are saying dialogue, which feels relevant, which feels real and grounded. And all of that came from having a conversation with researchers. And that is of course what Ochre is here to do. Um, it is here to connect the research and entertainment um, sectors uh, for collaborations. So this is actually a really pertinent conversation. I guess a couple of examples that are memorable for me were my involvement in the building of two, two planetarium films. So for the first film, which is We Are Aliens, I featured as an astrobiologist and my role was to explain the importance of robotic missions to Mars. The, the, the concept of world building, as, as Becca you know, alluded to, is, is cross, uh, cross sector collaboration. It's, it's interdisciplinary, uh, it's domain, domain agnostic. I love that. Uh, I love that expression. And uh, yeah, it's, it's very much about not doing this in isolation. And the academic community, I think, can play a huge part in this process. Um, you know, our, our report, we, uh, we, we did that in partnership with King's College uh, London and University of Nottingham, for, for instance. And there's a great appetite, I think, from the you know, academic community to, to collaborate more with um, the creative industries. So uh, yeah, I just wanted to, to echo that. Alex, and maybe has as well. Do you think that um, in the whole world building, are you th do you think new uh, fresh narratives are coming out or are, is the world building going back to the same old franchise, same old yeah. things that are there, you know, whether it's Star Wars, whether it is Marvel, uh, is, is, is new talent being encouraged yeah. to come up with new ideas? I mean, from my perspective, I think it's still very, very nascent in in film and I think it has got this uh, stigma attached to it as well but it is about Marvel franchises and and science fiction what we're really clear about is this this creative and collaborative process doesn't need to be tied into any 
particular genre or, or you know, or, or output. But I think it's it's really challenging. I think because um, simply because there's no real financial model to to have this you know level of development and and time. It, it takes time. In terms of um, collaboration, or oh, sorry, not um, the coronavirus pandemic. Does it provide an interesting sort of breeding ground for for for, for people to sort of think about some of these models uh, a little bit a little bit more? Um, are there are there some projects that you're seeing perhaps that are that are um, coming coming forward during this time that you wouldn't you know using these platforms and using this technology that that um, perhaps you know were in their infancy before but people are are kind of earnestly moving forward with it because it's the only way that's perhaps possible. Um, Alex, yeah, I just just wanted to um, to, to to add briefly um you know someone asked me I, I mentioned to someone in in the industry the other day you know we're releasing the future of film report which by the way is available at futureoffilm.live if anyone wants to to check it out um and it, they said is it still is it still relevant you know because there's been obviously so much change happen you know in in the, in the last month you know with cinemas closing and a, and a lot of you know shifts in distribution pattern i thought about it for a moment and i i realized it's more relevant it's more relevant now what we're advocating is a sustainable um virtual production process and also if if the world doesn't need some world building right now you know this is this is a this is an amazing time i think for for people to to create new stories that can move move our narrative forward i'm a wheelchair user and for example there's a lot of things that i'm unable to do in the real world and places that i'm unable to go and i suppose what's amazing about this technology and the type of content that's being created is that it makes the whole planet accessible to me, okay, in terms of mobile phone platforms, particularly, um, you know, something like that still gives, um, a, you know, it's one, it's a low cost way of accessing uh, these sorts of content, but also it gives someone like myself, um, you know, the ability to actually experience things that I can't in the real world. And I think that is probably one of the inspirations for my research in terms of trying to get a much, uh, more uh, well a more accessible way or an accessible format to people so that they can interpret data in future a lot of those virtual thing whether it's world building whether this it is doing what has does in from a small studio is all going to be uh, more normal than it has been and it it for our virtual VR uh, and our games and our world building industry, it can only be a good thing. Um, I'm wondering now if maybe this is a good time to talk about funding. So I think it would be really good to give a little bit of uh, background on, on Creative England and what we do. I mean, um, it's, it's really amazing to be on this panel and some really, um, you know, with people who are expert in world building and who are immersed in it um, and, and know a lot about world building and like doing it, uh, you know, on, on, on daily basis. Whereas I um, come from a slightly different angle, we at Creative England are, Creative England is a, um, is a national agency that supports creative sector and um, our, our support take form of um, not just money, uh, but also networking, uh, training, um, business support, investment readiness, really anything that we can do to support the creative se sector across the board, we try and do, it, do that. Um, and we've been doing it for a long time. And um, we started working with films as, as our sort of early uh, intervention. And we were very, um, uh, very aware that film, as Alex said very earlier, um, you know, existed sort of in a silo and on its own, but that time is changing and actually convergence of creative industries and various subsectors within creative industry was happening very fast. So we, we work across the board whether it's film, television, games, um, you know, design, software, um, AR, VR, across the, across the board. And um, what we try and do is, um, our, our main mantra is that creativity um, is everywhere, talent is everywhere, and opportunity is not. We see a lot of talented people um, not getting the, uh, the access they, they, they need to bring their creativ creativity to life. And, and actually get their projects funded. 
So what we do is we, in, in as many ways as we can, try and uh, connect those talented people to uh, money. Uh, we try and connect them to markets. We try and co connect them to skills. Um, try and connect them to facilities, crew, training, whatever we can. Creativity is something that should be applied to all challenges. You, know, you teach people to think openly and creatively. And I think that's what the modern world is asking of us. Every single week, you see something that amazes you. And an awful lot of it is homegrown. Britain's got an amazing history of storytelling, so it's a very exciting place to be working. Having worked in the industry for over 25 years, everything is growing. It's really exciting. It's all about those mistakes and doing that get you to a point of making something special. There's lots to be excited about. We're certainly having a golden age of television, incredible blockbuster films, we have amazing games, and we have this new industry, Immersive. It's cool that we have Creative England to, to support businesses which are emerging, it's, it's really important. We are Creative England, and we make amazing things happen. As the discussion unfolded, it was very clear that actually there's a lot more that um, the, this infrastructure, the support structure can do to encourage, um, you know, improvement in technology, use of technology, new narrative coming in, world building, you know, becoming sort of more, um, more of a tool to tell, tell stories. From, from Creative England perspective, um, we, we invest in companies, we invest in early stage businesses, um, and we invest in businesses who are, uh, who are within the creative space. So anybody who is in this space is a, is a really good candidate for us because we're really trying to encourage core creative um, businesses. And I guess that's where Oka comes in. I think for us, creativity um, is, uh, is, is very important, not just for economic growth of the country, but also for well-being, for innovation, for uh, solving you know, key problems, issues, and really opening up new worlds to, to us and, and imagining new worlds. And, and world building is really key in pushing, pushing that uh, innovation and, and imagination for the future. Amazing. Thank you all Amazing. so much. Thank, uh, you, thank, you. Thank, you. thank you for watching. OCA is a new global hub of expertise bringing together the research, entertainment and social impact sectors. To find out more, visit OCA.org and follow us at OCA Social.